So uh, I was I used to talk a little about creativity because there was this talk by uh, Professor Ken Robinson on how schools kill creativity. Any of you have seen that TED talk? Any of you? Uh, yeah, Nirubha has seen it. But try and have a look at it, particularly those of you who have children and who are planning to have children. It's a very interesting talk about the importance of creativity uh, for the future as we face an uncertain future. Why is creativity going to be the single most thing that will see us into the future? So that was always in my mind. Uh, but when Niruban recommended me to go to the TED talk, I was thinking, so what is an idea worth sharing? And then I realized that from my own life, uh, there was a part of my life that was, uh, I was brought up with a broad understanding of social consciousness. And when I look back, I realized very quickly that some of the most important moments of my life didn't come from technology and all the success that we have had as a neighbor. It came from a different place. And I thought that's also something that was worth sharing with you today. Because I think in leadership, these two qualities are what will provide leadership for the future, particularly as we sit here uh, in Sri Lanka and face what I think is a, is a frightening future. And we can talk about it. Uh, about Enable, I'll keep very brief uh, so that you have some context to, uh, to the background. Um, so we started Enable, as you said, about nine years ago. Uh, 13 of us came, came out of uh, fairly good jobs and we realized that technology was being used in Sri Lanka, particularly information technology, largely as technology. They were not delivering business outcomes. So the conversations we had was largely with IT people. They were nice guys, don't get me wrong. Anyone in IT? So that I don't offend you all any further? Okay. <laughs> right. So, uh, uh, I mean, uh, yes, uh, IT, uh, they do an important job. but. Uh, there was no place for IT in, in, in the boards, for example. So they were not really focused on delivering business outcomes. So we realized that companies were spending millions and millions of dollars on IT, even today. There are companies that spend and very little to show for it. We asked them, what did you do with all these millions? How did it touch the lives of consumers particularly? Very little. And I can take examples from banking and telecom, where we work. You all know this. You all go to banks, you all, go to, you all use telecom services. How much do they really know you? How much is the technology used to really understand who you are? And that's why some of the most leading companies in the world, and we'll talk about them later, they understand consumers very well. They use technology to know you. In fact, know a little too much about you. So, um, we realize that to be relevant, we need to use technology to deliver business outcomes. And that's what we did. And I must say, thankfully, we have grown... Uh, very well. We have grown to about almost 200 people now. But more than the number of people, and we have had, uh, you know, compounded annual growth rate of uh, revenue and profits of more than 40-45% over the last nine years. Um, that's all good. But what is interesting is we, we do some interesting work for our customers. And whereas most IT companies talk about fixing today's problems, we are constantly challenging our customers, are you ready to look at the future a little more. Uh, so that's the conversation we have. Take technology and drive them towards an unseen future. Uh, and that brings us to what we focus on our company, sustainability. And that is a key point that I want to talk to you about. Uh, because as we become successful, we get caught up with our own you know, success. And we think that's what's going to drive us. Look around you, look around the world, look at the, some of the top companies that have failed. They were the best, they took comfort in the fact that they were the best, and before they knew it, someone came and disrupted them. And they were largely disrupted by two things. Technology, for sure, but there was something smarter that they did. They changed the business model of how they charged and provided services to you. So we'll, we'll talk about that also in a minute. Um, so we realized very quickly that staying focused on just your earnings growth year after year after year after year is not going to make it. And what we needed to do was focus on what we call long-term sustainability of the company, mean create value over the long term. So how do you do that? Most companies are crazily focused on earnings. Every quarter, you know that. Who are the people under earnings pressure in this room? In sales and so on. Earnings pressure. I hope your folks are not on earnings pressure. <laughs> so very few, fortunately, you're, you're, you're happy, happy citizens. 
there are some who are quarter on quarter. Now this craze has come to banking also. They all have quotas and, you know, everywhere they are under pressure. But will they be able to sustain themselves into the future if they keep on pushing earnings only? All the findings say it won't sustain you into the future. Why? Even today, survey done by uh, Harvard Business Re uh, Review, Harvard Business School, they were quoting another survey. I don't know actually who did the survey. They said even today, 2017, 61% of executives, what do they do when they are faced with the earnings pressure? Take a guess. What do most executives and directors do? The first thing they do when they are under earnings pressure. They have told the uh, stockholders that they are going to make an earnings of so much. They are under pressure. What do they do? They drop people. They lay off. Mostly they cut what they call costs. So, they cut people, they cut recruitment, they cut project. First thing they say, freeze all employment. Put off projects. Then they find little by little that eats into the sustainability of your company. So, for us, we are very clear, particularly in IT, because the technology is disrupting us. It's a funny, bloody situation to be in, right? We are in technology, and the technology is killing you. Example. So we, when we started, we sold big servers and storage and all this IT infrastructure. Quickly we found that there was a thing called cloud technology that was emerging. Cloud is like what? Analogy. Electricity. Who is the fool who generates his own electricity at home? Maybe we should start because the way costs are going up. But sustainable energy. But, you know, that's where they said computing is like electricity. Turn it on, turn it off. Turn it on, turn it off. Or like water. And you pay per usage. They change the business model. So companies need not invest in large systems. Sometimes they are not using, sometimes they are under capacity. So always there's a problem. Here you take what you want. Now we realize that with cloud computing coming in, we couldn't be thinking of ourselves being sustainable into the future. So we were selling cloud. And the cloud was eating us. So we realized very quickly that we had to think differently and smarter about the changing landscape for us. And so when I looked at it, I realized what is it that is going to keep us, sustain our business and not die in the process of what's happening in the world. And actually it just boiled down to two things. Leadership and talent. That's about it. Nothing else. Investment, all that will come. Leadership and talent. Talent because we need very good skills in the chosen area. So talent is important. But leadership. And for us, don't make a mistake. Leadership is not about the position you hold. Leadership is not at the CEO level, at the board level, or at the very senior corporate management level. Leadership is at every level. There are different types of leadership, of course. But leadership, we found, is needed across the organization. Particularly as we realize that this hierarchical type of big company is not going to make it. The top management can't do all the thinking. So we broke ourselves into small groups. And these groups are highly autonomous groups. But they had a very clear shared vision. That's what leadership provides at the highest level. The first thing you need to do as a leader is to provide some idea, a clear idea, about where you are going. Then you have smaller teams empowered with their own leaders who will go out and get the job done. Now, just last week, I was in New York and I was talking to my son-in-law and he gave me a book by General McChrystal. You may or may not have heard of him. He led... The, the American troops when they were in a difficult situation in Iraq and he went in there and he quickly realized that all the might of the American military the firepower they had connectivity he said he had connectivity that no one could dream of he could be in the command center he could make a call to any leader in the world he could talk right down to the troops on the ground and he realized that the ISIS was whacking them because they were organized very differently. Small groups, highly motivated. 
Whether you agree or not, that's a different matter. That is not General McChrystal's problem. He has an enemy to fight. He quickly realized, and they were very dynamic. They could move very fast, small groups. He realized, unless we adopt that method, we are going to die. I don't think McChrystal has succeeded. Iraq is a mess. That's another story. That's not the topic of our discussion. We can have a chat about that later. But, so he realized teams. So for us, leadership, firstly, is across the company, across, the, across all levels. What do we look for in leadership today? And that's why I go back to Ken Robinson's talk and a survey done by IBM. 3,000 people they surveyed and they asked them, as you face an uncertain future, what is it that one quality that you're looking for? Or what is the top quality that you're looking for? Surprisingly, it was not technology or Harvard or INSEAD doctorate or anything like that. In a word, they said creativity. Because they said, as we face an uncertain future, what do we know about this future? Today we are hiring people and we don't know whether that skill is going to be relevant. I'm serious in 18 months. That's what's happening to our business. People are losing their relevance, technology people. Do we throw them out of jobs? No. So, creativity. What does that mean? It only means one thing to me. It means you're capable of looking at possibilities. What are the possibilities? Now, when we started the company, we faced a disaster. We started with 13 people. Who is from Dialogue? Ex-Dialogue. Anyone from Dialogue? Okay. Two people. So, we had a big plan. Dialogue had to, you know, grow their network. And, you know, so we thought... Fantastic, we had the right people. We had good relationship with them in my previous company. I had some people, so we put up the business plan. Eight million dollars was to come from dialogue from this project, three million, five million. We thought between five and eight million, great. Dialogue went down. Ten billion when we started. So business plan, not only dialogue, other telcos and all that. The year we started, zero. Next year, ten billion loss. Slide, graph sliding down like that. Match over. Business plan up in smoke. So what did we do? We realized there are other possibilities we need to look at. And we started back on the road again. Now when I was at Millennium, we wouldn't take a bid and deal unless $50,000 GP Natangan Nepa. Now we are back on the road. <laughs> Rolled our sleeves. So we would take on projects that were about $2,000, $3,000 GP, and when they brought the purchase order, we would applaud. So we looked at new technology and possibilities, and one of these things was a thing called virtualization. I won't go into that. But we suddenly created a market that today is completely disrupted by this technology called virtualization. We cottoned on to that. So we dumped what we were going to do and went in a new direction. And that is what our team is constantly trying to do because we are looking at creativity and possibilities and with empowering our people to do that. Now, how did I learn about creativity, you might ask? How did I, well, theatre, all that, yes. But I think this possibility, ingenuity, I learned from my mother. You see, I came from a family of 11 people. My father was 40, my mother was 20 when she married him, 20 year gap. So, he was a Catholic. So, you know, in the Bible they say, go forth and multiply. So, he went forth and multiplied. So, uh, in 20 years, he gave my mother 11 children. And one day, in 1962, he dropped dead of a heart attack. So, I am four. And now, man gone. There were 15 people in our house. Lower middle come family, 15 people, 11, my mother, grandmother, two cousins. Now what does my mother do? One man's pension, hardly enough. So I asked her many years later, because we all grew up well, you know, my family is doing all right, we are okay. So I asked her, so what, weren't you terrified when this happened? No. Why? I thought God, I knew that God will provide. I mean, simple, bloody proposition. <laughs> I mean, if he can live like that, fantastic, isn't it? God will provide. But of course, for God to provide, my family, brothers and sisters had to chug up their university and go and work. But I think it was an ingenuity. She had, you know, the capacity to 
deal with the situation. I'll tell you a story. Soon after we, uh, we went, we, my father died, we moved to a new house. And for some reason, our neighbor was not very friendly with us. He got angry. There was something that pissed him off about us, because maybe a large family. So he told that one day he was going to attack our house in the night. Now, we are a very timid family. So uh, my mother, because all good Catholics, she said, let's all kneel down and pray. So we prayed. But she realized that prayer alone won't save the day. She thought better to prepare. So game plan. So there's the door, which is barricaded. If they broke through the door, there were my brothers. They had uh, some garden utensils. I remember they had a alavangu, a crowbar, and a, a three, three-pronged pitchfork. Deadly instruments. Uh, and then behind my sisters, chili water. That is chili powder mixed in water. So if the gang broke through, the brothers will duck. Girls will throw the chili powder into the attackers. Then we go at them with the crowbar. It's a true story. Nobody came, fortunately, then that fellow became a good friend of our family. But you see, ingenuity, creativity, innovation, inaction. So I picked that up very early. And right through my life, I found, because I was involved in the, in the trade union movement, as you just mentioned, so we always innovated. Uh, for example, now when I was at the bank, I was about 22, and I was the president of the bank union of, of State Bank of India. Probably, you have been to, anybody has seen State Bank of India in Fort? Seen the building? You have seen. Are you a banker? And which bank do you? Next door, HSBC, right? Your bank looks very lovely, nicely painted. The State Bank looks run down. Typical, huh? So, uh, so State Bank, I was the leader of the union, the president, we had others also. And then we were some dispute, some pay dispute. So uh, we thought, okay, strike action, but that's a drastic action. Save that for, the, for later. We decided, so what do we do? So we came up with a small innovative idea. All the men decide to come to work in sarongs, the ladies in house coats. So now, ladies, of course, wore the house coats over what they were wearing. We, of course, took our trousers off and only sarong and nothing much under. So uh, now <laughs> you can imagine, if you go to State Bank, you'll imagine this scenario. Majestic building, right? Not like these banks now. Uh, large columns, high ceiling, fabulous uh, you know, window, old like Dickens. And uh, emblem saying the old name of the State Bank, Imperial Bank of India. And we are running around in our sarongs and house coats, like on a Sunday morning after going to the toilet, ablutions and just... But work got done. Customers were served. The customers talking to us, they are on our side now. So, very soon, the bank's image was suffering. They sorted the matter. So, innovation, creativity. So, this is what I think is important today in, in leadership. So, you've got to be able to think of possibilities, a new way of doing things, you know, and deal with problems that are thrown to you in, in a different way. So, second point, how, how much time do we have? Nick? We have five more minutes. So, um, and, and you see, we, 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 we see this in our, in our company also. Uh, and when you leave, give people, once, they are, once you arouse their creativity and give them a purpose to go after, you see they always produce results. Now, if you take our company, now today, we are building a tier three data center for Sri Lanka Telecom. Now, that was started by a completely uh, young, I mean, you know, he had no idea how a data center would be built. But because we dealt with some technologies, energy saving technologies, we decided he could run that. Fifteen million dollars, hell of a risky bet. But because he was so convinced, he went and bid for that, won the project, and now very soon you'll see that coming up in Pitipana. Unimaginable for a company like us. IT, what are we doing building data centers? Then, railway. Our guys decided, we have some IP technology that is very good. We bid for a project in railway, you know, this unguarded railway, you know, to have some traffic lights. So there's a controller board when the train comes at a particular speed, it tells you, then it triggers the light. Very, very simple in that sense. But we could go beyond what we were doing without just staying IT, server, storage and all of that. Then our guys got into data. Data became very interesting. So very creatively, this uh, anybody from MAS, Diane's company? XMS. So we went to MAS 
and now uh, and started talking to them. They said we have a problem about one particular company, uh, in you know staff turnover. So we said okay, let's try to do something about it, and we built a model for them, which predicted who are the people who will leave in the next three months. We gave forty-seven names, forty-three left. So you know, and we never had a word in our business plan about any of this. It is just that people were empowered. Go find something, build some skill, be supported, and try out things. And that is what has sustained us, as we have seen from the time we started. At least six to ten companies, whom we know very well, died. IT companies, and even as we speak, some very large companies are disappearing. So, second thing, consciousness. Now, the, we are building teams and we are working with our staff. The one thing that we think keeps us in the business is our employees. How many companies really have a consciousness about their employees? That's where we started. Now, a lot of companies will sacrifice their employees. First thing they do, like you said, headcount, cut headcount, take benefits off, don't give anything on their own. We realize that one of the important things for us is the sustainability of our own employees. We would never lay off anyone. But most importantly, we realize when these people are working here, there has to be a balance between their work and their personal life. And a lot of them are young; they have children. So first thing we started, we built a little children's section. They are a small place for them to bring their children, and you know, not a crash. Little older, where they can come and spend time. But most importantly, we realize that they have to be part of what we are trying to do at Enable. So we involve them very deeply in the kind of conversations and discussions we have. And even the lesser people. Now, one of the things that happens today is outsourcing of work. It's a terrible practice. So these people come to our office. They do our tea and coffee and all that, but they don't get any of the benefits. And we realize very quickly that some of them are paid only about eighteen thousand to fifteen thousand rupees a month, and that is if you come to work every day. So we started talking to these people. We went to the Hemas board and said we must give them a sustainable life. And they said if any company is providing us outsourced labor, they need to provide them with provident fund. They need to provide them what's a living wage, and we supplemented it with our own money, so that we could sustain them, the least of our people. And they come with us for any trip that we go to. Even when we went to Singapore, the old company, they are part of our culture. And we always tell our staff, be conscious of these lesser people in the organization. So consciousness starts with our own employees. Secondly, consciousness about yourself as a leader. That's where I think a lot of leaders miss the bus. Firstly, they must put themselves. In the discipline of the employees, and say, "Look, I'm conscious that I'm not perfect." So, in Siad, when I went to Siad, they were looking at leadership styles, and then I uh, realized they said, "Work on two things that is stopping you from being a great leader." And what did I do? I discovered one: timeliness was a huge problem for me. Today, I called and said, "I'm going to be six minutes late or a few minutes late." Timeliness was one, and secondly. Was the ability not to let the others speak first. At a meeting, I'll go, I'll start talking. I'm excited, and so new ideas don't come. So I told myself these are the two qualities I need to work on. I came back and told my staff, I'm going to work on these. Help me. So you open yourself out to complete criticism of the of the team, and say here are my two fundamental flaws, and I'm sharing this in a forum like this. And I'm going to work on these two: timeliness. Meetings will start on time. Swiss German time. Professor Woodward will come and talk to you about it. And letting others go first at meetings. Let them speak first. So just with those two qualities, now the staff feels. I say he's opening himself up to us. And I said, call out if you are late. Very few people would do that. And that's what Insia taught me. So you're conscious of yourself as a business leader, and you open yourself out to them and say. Help me. This is what I need to work on. 
then they will go and work on their own leadership styles and how they are dealing with their own employees. So we created a whole new culture of awareness of leaders in each of their teams. But I think today, as this country faces a terrible future, and I'll tell you why, to be a true leader, I believe you need to be conscious of the larger issues that surround us. And that is where I think we are failing as a country. Now take the problems that confront us. In 2019, two years from now, when our current creditors come calling, our debt will be $3.9 billion. Today our reserve, foreign debt. Today our reserves are $4.1 billion. In 2019, we will need to have a growth enough to have about $7 billion in deposits so that we can pay the debt and we can cover the gap of, of our forex gap. We are not going to make it. We have had the worst drought in 40 years in this country has faced. And we are not going to have the growth rates. Now you don't have to be ahead of IMF to figure out that's not going to, we are not going to get there. Corruption. We are number 95 in the, in the Transparency International Corruption Index. We have slipped, I think we were about 70 odd. We have slipped to 95. And all of us are part of this corruption. We are happy to say don't, but when it comes to a deal, we are the first to go and offer something. Singapore, the country we aspire to be, is number eight in corruption. But the thing that really worries me are two things, health and education. Take health. We are having a huge problem with the kidney disease today. You know the number of people who are dying. 2,000 people get admitted every month, 300 people die. And a lot of the death is happening in, the, in Anuradhapura, the farming community. Now this is getting compounded. 30 years this has gone on. Kidney disease of unknown origin. And we still don't know with all the technology and all that, we still don't know what's causing it. And people are dying. The country needs 1,000 dialysis machines. We have only 180. And the doctors are working their butts off to get this done. Second problem, diabetes. Huge problem. One of the nine people in Singapore have diabetes and the Prime Minister of the country declared war. We have one out of five and we are doing nothing about it. Diabetes adds to kidney problems. Now the problem gets compounded. Then comes aging. 30% of our population by 2030 will be an aging population, over 65. Where are these people going to get health care? Increasingly, children are not looking after their parents. More and more people are going to home for the aged. The hospital system will have to support these people. Our hospital system will collapse because we are now reducing the money that we are spending on health. Last year to this year, 15 billion, how many dialysis machines could that have brought? And what do we focus on? Building port cities and such infrastructure. Education. Education, Professor Ken Robinson said, needs to foster creativity. But that's what we need for the future. Our system is killing creativity. Schools kill creativity, right? Take our Shishakti exam, scholarship. What do we do? How many parents have children going to scholarships here in this room? How many of you have children who are uh, primary or whatever? Right. You all don't send them for scholarships, none of you. Thank God. Because you see, you have seen what happens. They take these children, they, have, they, have, they go for a nationally competitive ex exam when they are 10 years old. And what do they do? Send them for tuition when they are 5 years old. Every day, unheard of in our generation. So what do they do? They kill their childhood. These are the people we are going to hire in the future. This is the leadership that we are going to create in this country. And we kill their, we kill their joys of childhood and kill their human spirit. Now, can we be indifferent to these issues? Is the question that I'd like to pose to you for those of you who are thinking of leadership. And I say... True leadership means we've got to use our creativity for something of a larger cause, a consciousness of our society and the people we live with, and I say the planet, because of the environmental issues and so on. But now you take companies like Google, Amazon, Facebook, these, these are companies that you all, all think of, right? We want to aspire to be like them. What do they do? Google, Facebook, Amazon and Apple, they pay 2% tax today. They expect to pay 35. They're very creative companies, Silicon Valley. 
they use the most ingenuous systems to avoid paying taxes. And today, Apple in Europe alone, back taxes, they are going to be charged 14 billion pounds that they have not paid. Now, this is all money that will go towards important public spending, which is deprived. Facebook paid in the UK $4,000 tax. Same as a factory worker. Now, is this the kind of creativity that people are absorbed into companies like this that you want to serve? Or shouldn't some part of you as leaders or aspiring leaders say, I am going to use some of my talent, something that I've picked up and learned for the betterment of a, a fellow human being. And I said in my TED talk when I finished, I said, suppose you have 30 seconds to reflect on your life. What will you think about? Your career? Your family, you're provided for them, wonderful. But what if you realize that you have used some of your talent and potential to address one of the many inequities that this, that this country faces? Only then can you say that my life was well lived, that my life was worth it. And that's what I want to share with you today. Creativity and consciousness. And I say, an ounce of consciousness is worth a ton of creativity. Because I think it's not just good enough for us to be business leaders. I think we need to be social leaders. And if we are not that, then I don't think there's much purpose served in the kind of leadership that I believe in. Thank you very much.